Today, I'm talking about the guidelines for the treatment of type 1 diabetes that were just presented at the ADA. And the first thing you have to know is that what we presented were just draft guidelines, so it's not gospel. And the actual final guidelines are going to be presented at the EASD meeting this fall. It's also important to know that you have 10 days in which to give us your comments. But let me tell you the story of how these guidelines began. So Dr. Richard Holt, who's in the UK, decided that we needed a set of guidelines for the management of type 1 diabetes because, frankly, it was always under the shadow of the treatment of people with type 2 diabetes, and also in part because the guidelines for the treatment of type 2 diabetes have been really well established and accepted around the world. So he decided to set forth an ADA EASD committee, and he chose 14 people from around the US and Europe. So seven are from the US and seven are from Europe. The first meeting was the EASD group alone, and they met in January of 2020. And the first combined group was in March of 2020. Now we all had visions of European meetings and everything else, but of course that didn't happen. Instead, we marched along through COVID to make these recommendations. The first thing we did was to narrow what we wanted to discuss. So something that we don't discuss is the management of the complications of diabetes because that's really the same in people with type 1 versus type 2 diabetes. And we wanted these to be very type 1 focused. The first thing that's important is how do we diagnose type 1 diabetes? And I'm going to go through that algorithm in a bit more detail because I think that's different than what we're used to. The next talks about aims and goals. And one of the things that we talk about is not only using metrics that come from CGM data, such as time and range, as a goal, we also say that in certain individuals, a target of perhaps even less than 6.5 makes some sense. So that we, in most people, recommend a target of less than 7. But there may be benefit to being even lower than that as long as that occurs without an unacceptable risk of side effects, particularly hypoglycemia. But we recognize now with some of the newer technologies, people can do better than ever. We provide a schedule of care. We talk about diabetes self-management, education, and support, monitoring. And frankly, we talk about the fact that Almost everybody with type 1 diabetes should be on a continuous glucose monitor with rare exceptions. We talk about insulin therapy, and one of the things that I think is important is we talk a lot about the use of analog therapy and insulin pumps and all, but we also talk about the use of non-analog therapy because around the world, not everybody has access to insulin analogs, and they're also much more expensive. We talk about hypoglycemia. We talk about a whole host of behavioral considerations, nutrition, alcohol, drugs, smoking, sleep, physical activity, sick day rules, driving, employment, and travel. We talk about DKA, not in great detail, but we do discuss it. We talk about psychosocial care, which is really important. And throughout this guideline, we bring it back to what does the patient want, what's important to the patient, we talk about social determinants of health. We talk about pancreas and islet cell transplantation, adjunctive therapies. We talk about special populations, pregnancy, older individuals, and people living with late complications. And we talk about inpatient management. Finally, in the end, we talk about emergent and future perspectives. We don't exactly tell you what to do but we do tell you what needs to be done and what needs to be considered in the management of our patients with type 1 diabetes. And hopefully this is the kind of guideline that can be refined over time to become more and more specific. So we provide a fairly complicated flowchart for the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes in adults, but let me just simplify it. You basically have an adult and you think they might have type 1 diabetes. If you think that, then you test for islet autoantibodies. In most people who have type 1, those antibodies will be positive, and you've diagnosed them with adult onset type 1 diabetes. In the 5 to 10 percent who are negative for antibodies, but you still think might have type 1 diabetes, then we suggest you think about them based on age. So if they're younger, 
you probably want to rule out monogenic diabetes. And if they're older, they may well have type 2 diabetes. So we give you a suggested pathway that looks at measurement of C-peptide and other features to try to determine between those two. Bottom line, of course, is it's always clinical. It's always based on what does the patient need to control their diabetes? Do they need insulin? Do they need the other agents? But we really try to give you a framework for trying to diagnose type 1 diabetes in adulthood. Next, we give you a flow for the general management principles of patients with type 1 diabetes. So the first question we always ask is, are glycemic targets being met? And we stress the need for individualization of targets. And when you're having this conversation with a patient, you want to see if they're at their target, are they comfortable at their target, and frankly, do they need anything else? Do they want to see a nutritionist or a diabetes educator? Do they have psychosocial issues that require them to see a mental health provider? Do they want change? So somebody may be doing well on their regimen, but perhaps they want to change. They may want to go on a continuous glucose monitor or a hybrid closed loop pump system. So we basically say, are glycemic targets met? And what does the patient want going further? If glycemic targets are not being met, we want to really figure out why. And that's obviously a conversation with the patient. There are many reasons that patients aren't reaching their targets. Some have to do with lack of education and lack of support. Some have to do with psychosocial issues and social determinants of health. Others have to do with the fact that they need different insulin, newer insulins, perhaps other technology. You really need to delve into why it is that a patient isn't meeting their glycemic targets. We stress throughout this that it's the patient's choice, that they need to feel good about what they're doing and the technology and the treatments they're using, and we need to help facilitate that. And we also talk about the fact that people can go back and forth. Say a patient is on multiple daily insulin injections, they want to try a hybrid closed loop pump system, they try that for a while, they want to switch back, that's fine. People can switch back and forth. Our goal as providers is really not to force patients to do any one thing, but to provide them with alternatives, as well as to our advice as to what seems to be the best for them at any given time. So we hope that these recommendations are useful in terms of giving a framework for the treatment of people with type 1 diabetes. We tried hard to include really all the aspects that we could think of, but again, these are draft guidelines, and so we encourage your feedback, and hopefully this can help us be more aware of how to better treat people with type 1 diabetes. Thank you.